I wouldn't have known. With the way you deep squat, I, I would never have guessed. I greatly yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. So this, we're here in, where the heck are we? We're, we're in Chino beautiful Hills. Chino Hills, California. Yeah. This is Dairy Town. Uh, Snoop Dogg was in jail at the Chino State Prison about half a mile from here. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Uh, he sings about it in one of his songs. Beautiful. Outside of that, we have a lot of ball players and special agents from all three letters of the uh, FBI, CIA, DEA who live out here and cops. Yeah. You have like a crazy, freakish story of how the heck you arrived into this place. I do. You had gasoline in your hair. I well, I didn't <laughs> arrive with gasoline, but I did get gasoline in my hair as a kid. Yeah. What's so? What, can yeah, you yeah. tell what the heck that was? Yeah. So you just like we, randomly threw that out. Like I need to know. Well, it's what, a good what hook, that's right? About. It's it, a good hook. It's a good hook. Yeah. So so check this out. We uh, we escaped the Soviet Union in 1980. I was uh, I was six years old. I was six years old. And when some people are like, well, were you scared? When you're six, six years old, you got your mom and dad, you really don't care about anything else, right? And so all I knew is we're going on a vacation or something, because I knew I'd heard we're going to Italy. But we escaped. My dad bribed the communist government to let us escape into, the, uh, into Italy. From Italy, we went into the American consul. From there, we said, hey, we are uh, political refugees. We hate communism, and we want to go to the United States. And we legally entered the United States in 1980. I was six years old. Mm. That part's important because... Literally three months later, we're living in some slummy apartment in, in uh, Cypress, California. And the apartment complex is so dirty, so filthy that I started, ah, I got scabs in my head, right? And, and we don't speak English. We don't understand the culture. We're broke. We don't have any money. Um, my dad literally has a, uh, a paper route. He pumps gas and he works at a pizzeria. My older and brother both have two, three jobs. Me and my mom stay at home um, and make do. And so my mom figures out that I've got lice. Hmm because the apartments were so dirty. Well, we couldn't afford lice treatment, and so my, my mom made my dad siphon out gasoline from a local car and used a cup of gas. She had me double over uh, on, you know, into the little quad section of the apartment, had me double over, and she washed my hair with gasoline because we couldn't afford lice treatment to deal with the lice that I had. Does that work? Welcome to America. It did work, apparently. Hey, I mean, <laughs> I got beautiful flowy hair there now. Here you are today, <laughs> lice free. How beautiful. Yeah. And so you, one of the things that you talk about that I think is really relevant is that you call it the the immigrant edge yeah 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 so kind of having that like grit about you yeah is that something that you and i don't think it's exclusive to immigrants i think it's exclusive to anyone that comes from pennsylvania who probably comes (laughs) from country yeah right amish country (laughs) or like let's say steel workers (laughs) people who have like you know really struggled who have struggled growing up i found have what i call the i call the immigrant edge because i'm an immigrant when you've suffered you've eaten out of garbage cans you've uh you know, government cheese, government bread, food stamps. You have to make the decision between do we have lights or um, electricity or do we have running water? My dad had to make those decisions a lot as I was growing up. Yeah. And so that kind of gives you this advantage that any when you grow up and you start a business or you start a family and you have some hardships, you go, wait a minute, this isn't as bad as that. You always have something to compare against to. Yeah. Right? And you go, this, this isn't so bad. And so it's almost like this adversity has become an advantage in my life because we moved around so many times. I went to so many elementary schools, junior highs, high schools, that I know how to build rapport with a quickness because I didn't know how long you and I are going to be friends before we get kicked out of an apartment and have to move across town, yeah, new huge. school. So uh, it's an advantage for me. People are like, oh, that's sad. You don't have any school friends that you grew up with. I go, no, but I've got this ability now to build friends with anyone. So I'm like yeah. rich with friends now because... I don't know how long we're going to be friends. I still kind of operate in that way, right? Yeah. And that's an immigrant edge. Um, to me, no matter how bad the economy is, let the economy crash. Like, I started my, my fitness franchise in 2009, right after the economic crash. Everybody else was contracting. I was like, hey, the economy is still great. My hair's not being washed with gasoline. I'm not eating out of the dumpster. The economy's fine. Yeah. I just need to fi- figure out how I'm going to get this franchise in the hands of people who want it, right? So, again, that's the immigrant edge mentality to take this adversity and go, it's still an advantage. It's really a reframe, a mental reframe. Mm. And I think more people should experience adversity or put themselves in positions to experience it. One of the easiest things I do is I just take my, my whole family to Tijuana. And I'm like, hey, guys, let's experience how this is. Yeah. Let's experience how this is. And because the life we live now is quite different than the life I had when we came to the States. Yeah. So that's something that I personally take for granted and sometimes I'll witness and be like oh yeah rapport is is huge I'm always talking about it you know but I think I take it for granted sometimes when you see someone that really has issues making connection with somebody else you're like 
Oh, I see it. It's a real, it's a real yeah, thing. It is. You know, is there any kind of like tools or practices or awarenesses or anything that you have in the sense of creating rapport with somebody? 90-10 rule. 90% mm. of the time, let them do the talking. 10% of the time, you ask the questions. Yeah. And I always start the questions with, who are you? What do you do? Just like we, when we just met here, right? We just did it. Yeah. We who just are you? What do you That's do? Who like, do you know? Film this. Yeah. We're doing rapport yeah. right now. <laughs> right, right. This is like the real thing. Yeah, yeah. But really, it is like most people just want to vomit at the mouth because they figure like you need to know my story, bro. You don't care about me until you realize how much I care about you. And mm. so my job is just to ask questions, and you have to truly care. You don't just go, "Here's the three questions I'm going to ask: Who are you? What do you do? How do we know each other?" Because that was the next question I asked, right? Like, who connected us? How do we know yeah, each other? Oh, we yeah. know Jason Frugio. We know this guy. We know Craig Valentine. Well, that's fantastic, but I actually have to give a shit. I have yeah. to care. And if I ask with compassion, you see that I understand and care, you're going to start actually asking me questions and the rapport starts getting built. Yeah. But most of the time, it's the other 90-10. We want to just vomit at the mouth and tell you, let me tell you who I am. Let me tell you what I do. Let me tell you where I came from. Let me tell you the hardships I had. And you're like, uh, I got a story. I got a life. Yeah. I want to connect. You actually gain power by listening to someone. I've noticed this as well. This is all things that I'm starting to, I think, steadily, maybe with the podcast, becoming a little bit better of a sure. communicator. I still have, I'm nascent, you know, but I'm like, oh, okay, I'll see some things. But yeah. sometimes I'll, I'll meet people and they'll just be just vomiting on me about all the stuff that they do and this and that. And I can kind of see their, their face looking away, like in disbelief in certain things that they say. And kind of like, oh, you don't believe what you're saying. Mm. You know, and you're kind of, you're saying a lot, but you're not really actually saying anything. Yeah. You know, you know what's funny about that? Well, I've caught that too. And um, so my wife and I are, we're, she's on her eighth time going through psychocybernetics. I'm on my fourth. I'm a little slower reader. Uh, I don't know what that is. Psychocybernetics, great book called by Maxwell Maltz. He was a, check this out, he was a cosmetic surgeon in the 40s, 40s and 50s. He started in the 40s, went to the 50s. Uh, cosmetic surgeon and attorneys would come to him. No, at the time it wasn't even a cosmetic surgeon, a plastic surgeon, plastic surgeon. And the only time people would come to him is when a burn victim, a car accident, right? Like, hey, piece my face back together, make me look somewhat what I used to look like. Yeah. But he found very quickly that attorneys would come to him, um, beautiful models would come to him, and, and you know the attorney would say, well, I, I need you to help pin my ears back just so. And if you can pin my ears back just so. And he would ask why. And like all the other plastic surgeons, he would ask, why, why, why do you want that? Well, you know, I, I'm in court a lot, and, and I know that if I just had my peer, ears peer, pinned back just so, I would communicate better, I'd feel more confident about myself, and I would win more cases. And he realized very quickly that there's a self-image issue that everybody suffers from. Right. And so we all talk very quickly and want to vomit out our story and try and hope that we can throw enough stuff at you so that you can hook onto it and go, okay, there's a commonality there. But we talk quickly because most of the time we grew up with our parents not wanting to listen. So it's like, get out with it, son. What do you want to say? We go, blah, 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 and we throw up at them. And we grow up, we still have that self-image of what others think, or we think what we know what others think of us, which is, they're probably not interested in me. There's nothing spectacular about me. And I'm going to do what my dad wanted me to do, which is just get out with it already or else. And so people still speak that way and then turn their face away, retract, simply because they're reacting to how their dad treated them and never did the work on the self-image. Mm. Great book, Psycho-Cybernetics, yeah. Yeah, you gotta check that out. I was just reading this thing, Aldous Huxley, are you familiar with him at all? I wrote a no. book called The Island, pretty, pretty rad guy. Um, show notes, Aldous Huxley. Um, and one of the things he mentioned in there was certain music he referenced like, like Mozart and Beethoven, and a big thing is the spaciousness in the music, right? So that capacity to have a pause with someone, all of a sudden it creates this space of like maybe engagement or allure sure. or whatever it may be. You know, they compared it to some other musicians where it's like, no, 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 no. You know, it's yeah, like, and it's, yeah, it's yeah. cacophonous. It's hard to grab onto anything because there was never that, that confidence to create space. It's like, I don't need to feel every sure. second. Sure. You know, is that like a practice of some sort or is that something that you just have? I think confidence is a huge one. I think it. confidence, it comes from confidence. I think the less confidence we are, the more, it's just like the bully thing, right? The bullies who are most aggressive, violent, are the ones who lack confidence and therefore roar, roar, and roar mm -hmm. louder. Um, it's usually the silent ones that are the most deadly, right? 
And so it goes back to confidence, self-image, self-esteem. I think there's a big trifecta there because we all come damaged. Another great book, speaking of show notes for yourself, another great book, uh, The Body Keeps the Score. Ah, love that one. Okay. Yeah, it's an important one. Yeah, and the author talks about how, what, one in three people have had some kind of uh, physical or emotional abuse and one in four have That's had hard. some kind of sexual abuse. Like, holy smokes. Yeah. That is... So I look at it this way. We're all walking around. Even though, let's say, we're friends... We develop a friendship, and one day you text me, and I'm like, hey, bro, sorry, I can't make it. Something came up, and you're like, heard about it. Not that you would be. You're obviously evolved. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. Look at how you cross I, your legs. I Clearly you're that. evolved. I received that. I sit like a Neanderthal. <laughs> yeah, my knuckles should be dragging right now. <laughs> but, oh, it's good. It's just different styles. Going, we can talk about the Sith, though. Yeah, so that'll can, be another, that'll yeah, be another yeah, podcast. You, that'll yeah, be a whole You're going to talk me to so many illnesses by the time you leave here. I'm going to go right to the, right <laughs> yeah, to the hospital yeah, from here. Really good. But anyway, so, so really, the way I look at it, I envision this, that we're a whole bunch of people. We have friends. We have family. We have colleagues. But we've never dealt with that crap, yeah. right? The, the abuse, whether it's sexual, physical, mental, emotional, the trauma. Let's just call it trauma, the umbrella. And so we're walking around with all these cuts and sores on our bodies. And I mean to hug you because you're a friend, but when I do, it hurts. And I go, what the hell, bro? You just hurt me. Hmm. And I come out fists up. And I think when most people react to a text message like that or overreact to things or misread things, it really is because you haven't healed. And if you haven't healed, you're lacking confidence. Hmm. Now you're saying my loved ones are hurting me, the spouse, my kids, my friends, my partner, business partners. And, are they really, or you just haven't healed and you haven't done the work, and maybe it's about time you do the work, because statistically speaking, most of us are hurt. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the, the filter that you perceive the world from. The, the first step, I think, is, Joe Campbell, I mentioned this a lot and on, on here, is it calls it detribalization, which is you go outside of your tribe, and you realize for the first time that you actually are raised from a tribe. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so everything that you thought was normal... Right. Is not normal at all. Mm -mm. It's just within that dogma that you were that you were indoctrinated into. Yeah. You know, and I think that that's the same thing with like the trauma that you may or may not carry with you throughout the day. To you, it's just normal. You know, but the process of, of being able to witness yourself and realize, like, wow, I have this whole big, you know, deck of filters that I perceive the world from. Yeah. You know, is that something that you have you like? come into awareness of the of filters in yourself every single day i still do mm. so in 2013 2013 i had an anxiety attack so big in fact so i got the drumsticks there it's i know it's off camera i got the drumsticks there and i have a drum set at home but it's in my guest house um and so i go across my pool deck with shoes on but i play the drums <clears throat> very much like you are right now barefoot and so I take my shoes off, and apparently when I left the guest house, I didn't bring my shoes with me. So the next day is a Monday. I go upstairs looking for my shoes. I bend over to pick them up. My arms are tingling. My throat's shutting down. Mm. Like, I'm choking. My heart's racing. I'm getting sweaty. Tunnel vision. I'm like, oh, shit. I'm having a heart attack, dude. Right? I'm like, I'm yeah. 38 years old having a heart attack. This can't be happening right now. And very quickly, I'm like, well, what do I do? I need to stumble down the staircase, get to the house so that my wife can call 911. As I go outside, I don't know if it's the fresh air or just the movement, all the symptoms go away. Just yep. kind of fade away. I'm just left a sweaty mess. I'm like, you know what? I'm all right. I cheated death. Off to work I went. Turns out it was an anxiety attack. The next day I went to the doctor. My wife made me go. And it was an anxiety attack. My first one of many that I was going to have. Yep. Xanax didn't work because I was not creative for, for my work. And so I said, you know what? There's got to be a psychologist or a therapist or someone I can go to. Found a therapist, went to him after 16 months of work. The first four weeks, we worked through my anxiety attacks. Fixed, gone, done. I knew how to deal with it, right? What did that look like? Hey, I'll tell you what it looks like. Yeah. All anxiety is, is anticipation of future pain. When someone is having an anxiety attack, they're really anticipating some future pain. Likely manufactured, but still anticipating that future pain. In other words, great, the best example my therapist Kevin gave me was, before you go on stage to talk for the first time, you're picturing you're going to freeze up, lock up. People are going to start smirking, laughing at you, looking away. That's anticipation of future pain. Then you start having an anxiety attack before you even get up on stage, not realizing that people might go, hey, you, what do most people do? Hey, you got this. You're doing fine. Just relax. They start clapping for you. That happened to me the first time. And it just washes over you. And you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm loved. I'm yeah, loved by humanity. Really loved. People love me. But again, we come with our damages, so we go, I'm going to be ridiculed. 
And so as I'm working with Kevin, I, and, and the thing he taught me was one, it's anticipation of future pain. And he goes, here's four letters that I want you to just remember. Halt, the word halt, H-A-L-T. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. When you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, you're gonna, you're gonna have an anxiety attack. The alcoholic is gonna go hit the bottle. The drug addict is gonna go, go find drugs. The sex fiend is gonna go, go find a prostitute. And that's just what we do when we're hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Those are emotional triggers that take us back to our vice, right? It's like, all right, so I just need to manage those four things. Easy enough, hmm. easy enough. And over time I did, and it's about self-care. But man, talk about an evolution. The next, like I said, four weeks of working on that, the next 15 months were spent on dealing what happened to me as a kid, right? Becoming more self-aware. And I was, I was uh, sexually abused as a kid in Armenia. And when Kevin first brought it up, I don't even know how he saw it. He goes, so what happened to you as a kid? You wanna talk about that? I was like, ah, I don't wanna talk about that. The thing that happened to that little boy is fine, Kevin. Oh. And he goes, that happened to who? I think it happened to that little boy. It's fine. I'm good. Kevin, let's talk about something else. He goes, do you realize you're... You put him over there. You put him over there. He goes, that's called disassociation. I'd never even heard that word. Yeah. I go, what's that? He goes, that's actually the first step into creating a multiple personalities. Wait a minute. Yeah. I just put this little boy in a box and put him away, right? Today, I can say that happened to me. So first time ever, after 15 months of working with him, after that point, I was able to deflate that ball that I was holding underwater, and then when it would pop up, because you can only hold it for so long, is when you rage out on someone, get angry at someone, lash out, right? And now I just look at it, it's just a blip on my radar. We took the air out of that because in the air inside that balloon for me, that ball that I was holding underwater was rage, confusion, and shame. Mm. I dealt with it. But we forget to, and when, I, when you deal with that, that's almost like that little arm that lets the car go through. Now that allows me to explore other parts of my life, but I'm, I was stunted until then, and I, and I protected myself by building muscle, yep. by kill, uh, creating seven different companies, all on recurring income, and this is, I was so proud of them, like, Kevin, I got seven companies, all on recurring income, all seven or eight figure businesses, and I'm gonna create 10 more. And he's just like, oh man, he's protecting him, like yeah. insulating himself, <laughs> It's right? worse than I thought. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so I was so unaware of who I was, unevolved, and I needed that journey. It was painful. Many times I walked away with foggy-headed, feeling like I was walking through molasses. I tell my wife, I just feel like I'm walking through molasses and I'm foggy-headed. But the outcome was amazing. Mm. I think more people should take that journey, whatever that journey looks like to them, but it's painful, it's scary. Yeah, yeah, the halt. I really like that, and then it's it's kind of ironic that oftentimes being in the depths of the halt also is where most of the epiphanies and like the truth and kind of that that communication with a deeper part of yourself. Yeah. So as long as you stay within the bumpers and within yeah. the insulation, then it's great. You probably won't have an anxiety attack, right? But it's kind of like anti fragile kind of kind of thing. Yeah. Like like we need to have little skirmishes mm -hmm. in order to to actually evolve and not have a big nuclear explosion. Exactly. You know, so actually, I think that sometimes we have, as you're saying, I'm like, yes. And then I think there's also something to embracing the halt. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, is that something that, that's, that you've, have you learned from your halt experiences as well? Is that something you can kind of... I have, and it's exactly what you said. And the, the example I can give you is, you know what? I might take three or four Advil if I have a headache. Yeah. Now, if I take a whole bottle... I'm likely gonna have some kind of an ulcer or some kind of an issue. And it's no different than we, when you go to the gym and work out. If I'm constantly breaking down my muscles and never given enough time and food to reheal, I'm likely gonna end up with liver damage or kidney damage in the hospital, right? But if I actually tear down my muscles in the gym when I work out and then feed it, rest it, nurture myself, it's gonna grow. So we do need to push ourselves into the adversity, into the pain, into the darkness. Yeah. It's when we go off the deep end, and I would constantly, all of the type A personalities go off the deep end because we are all in on everything. You know, people listening to podcasts while driving and brushing their teeth, you're probably type A because if you weren't, you would just do one thing at a time, and odds are it would be something that wouldn't be, you know, growing your mental space. It would be something more trivial, like just wasting time, whatever, playing video games mindlessly. Right. Um, the concept of wasting time I find really interesting. You know, someone that has a, a large void to fill, like like um, I think myself, and it seems like you're, you know, certainly alluding yeah. to, to yourself. 
uh, sometimes that feeling of I always need to be, you know, optimizing or making it the most efficient or maybe a little, you know, and it's like, it's all a do-based mentality, you know, and, and culturally, again, we kind of, we kind of almost like frown on, on people that are more in like the B type space. Yeah. They're, they're dirty, stupid, mindless hippies. I wouldn't say they're dirty, stupid, mindless <laughs> hippies. I wouldn't go that far. Right, you're pretty the close between the two. Yeah, yeah, Sometimes yeah. they are kind of mindless yeah. hippies. Like it's not, if you're too much B, well, a little dude. Yeah, and if you're too much A, listen, you're going to have a heart attack and die and you're going to leave your kids orphaned. Yeah. I mean, that's just the reality. It's, right, right, right. It goes right. back to the, am I going to take the bottle of Advil or yeah. just three pills, yeah. right? It goes back to that. Am I going to explore the darkness or am I going to go off the deep end, Yeah. right? And, and look for a rope to hang myself. And that's unfortunate what happened to Robin Williams, right? He was Very constantly true. exploring and that's where his best humor came out of. Like, I'm a big fan. I've watched documentaries. I've read all about him. His best humor came from the darkness. Yep. But when he was left alone and just kept looking over the edge, let me just get a little closer. Ah, oh, there I went. What's your alone time like? My when you alone... don't have any kind of work or any type of success to kind of anchor yourself off of. I love driving. I love <laughs> driving. I love surfing. So the things that really require... I love going... There's an outdoor shooting range out here. I go outdoor sh uh, shooting, you know, and... My alone times are spent doing that. Uh, rarely do I read books. I, I listen to audiobooks. Yeah. Um, but man, I just love to drive. To them. For example, uh, Craig Ballantyne and I, we spoke at Joe Polish's event last week. We both had flights to fly back to Southern California. I'm like, hey, dude, let's just skip our flights and rent a car and drive back to the desert. You know, I go, I want to listen to an audiobook. Uh, and it wasn't even like a make money or marketing audiobook. It was literally just a fun book yeah. about. Oh, it was, I know what it was. It was the operator, the Navy SEAL that, that killed Osama bin Laden mm. and how Navy SEALs think and operate and how I love those their mindset stories. is way different. Yeah, right? It's so Just, different than my life, but for some reason when I watch those movies, I'm like, I'm like all <laughs> right. in the whole time. And that's probably why it's so different than my it's life. so different. Yeah. And so Craig fell asleep, you know, and I, I was just driving through the desert and like five hours. I love that kind of alone time. I love complete seclusion. Like I go to the ocean to Dana Point. And I surf during the week when no one else is in there. It's just me and maybe an, an old man who, who's obviously retired. And we'll talk a little bit. Then he'll be 100 yards away and I'm over here. And I'm in my own thoughts. And I love being in my own thoughts. It's, mm. it's, it's almost like I can feel myself vibrating with rejuvenation. It's the only word that comes to mind. It's like being refilled. Because every day I'm being taken away people are always feeding off of me. I look at it that way. Like, hey, coach, can you help me up on my business? Can you coach me up on my mindset? Yeah. Well, where do I plug in? Where do I plug in? Yeah. Coaches are great. I've got coaches, but I also need rest time, and I value that rest time. I protect that time. You've come to a point where you have so much access to create, you know, and you have so much access to give back, and to, like, it's the model that you have. It's like any time that you want to put your energy into that, you can really, you know, help yeah. and support and create change. For a lot of people, I think that the struggle is maybe the feeling like the alone time might be, and I wonder if you, if you t still you know, have this experience, but the alone time is like, I'm not doing enough. I used to feel that way. Yeah? Oh, man, my wife and I would argue a 10-day vacation. By, th by day three, I made it hell for her. Hmm. Hell. Uh, last year, we went to Scotland, Ireland, London for 10 days, and I, I was just a bump on a log. Do you have ale? Do you have ale? I just go to different pubs. I just want to drink ale and have a good time. Um, but again, it's that evolution of get, doing the work because I felt unworthy of, of anything unless I was producing. Yeah. Producing an outcome, producing money, producing product, producing uh, great coaching clients because my esteem, my value, my worth came from outside. Mm -hmm. Today it's internal. And so while I can eat, I have more access to do more, like, nah, because actually tomorrow night we're leaving for New York City and then from there going to Dallas. Uh, we're spending Thanksgiving on the road. I can't wait to just be a bump on the log, two workouts a day. I'm going to eat pizza at DeFaro's in Brooklyn. I, I, I'm just, I'm going to schlep around. I have no reason, desire to produce anything, and I'm not going to feel bad about it. Yeah. That used to not be me. How do you bridge that gap and bring bring the uh, disassociated self back on board. You do the work, man. I don't know if I can answer that here. Yeah, like, no, I know that's I wish not I could bring Kevin here to answer that, but yeah. I mean, you do, uh, at least... <laughs> Kevin! Maybe I'm a slow person. I don't even know, like, in the world of... 
could someone have gone through that faster? It took me 15 months. So first month was working on my anxiety, the reason I went to see him. The next 15 months was working through my childhood issues, right? And then him telling me that you don't need a rage. Uh, here's how we're going to take the confusion away and the shame away of all that. And, and, and the shame was like, why did this happen to me? People shouldn't know this. You know, if they do, then I'm a lesser human. Right. Uh, the confusion was, did I do something to make those two older boys do that to me? Like, mm. Am I gay? Yeah. Am right. I gay? Right. I mean, you start, the craziest things start happening. You start thinking, and then the rage was, how the fuck can anyone do this to me? I'll kill them. All right. Now, with that, go in that cycle of trifecta and try and get married, have kids, start a business, work on your fitness. How's that going to look? Yeah. How's that going to look? It's not going to work well. And so, how do you go from the disassoci disassociated self to a whole self? You do the work. What does the work look like? I don't know. What does it look like to everyone who's, it's different for everyone. Is there any physical practices that you found to be beneficial? Because I think that that's something that I see with a lot of people working with clients is they're literally starting to almost feel numb, right? I say quite a bit, like, oh, you're, you're disassociated from the back of your shoulder girdle or your back or your glutes or yeah. you're just not, there's no electricity there. Yeah. You're all right here in this little like cell phone world where it may be. Yeah. You know, so the, pro the, the process of starting to re-inhabit yourself, I think one of the ways is through a physical. You know, I think there's probably a lot of different there ways, is. but was there any kind of physical work that... There was no specific physical work we did. In hindsight, as you're telling me this, I'm like, oh my gosh, I realize what's happening. I actually gave myself permission to go and get a massage every week. Hmm. This is going to sound crazy, but I didn't want people to touch me. But oh. I, I, I didn't connect it to that. Aaron, I That's didn't connect good. it to that. You just made a big connection here. Good. <laughs> I didn't connect it to that. I was just like, I'm too busy. I don't need it. I'm fine. I foam roll, bro. What do I need you for, yeah, right? You're foam rolling yourself. Yeah. It's different. Yeah. Uh, now I just give belly hugs. I make sure my belly button connects to your belly button. <laughs> and I, Craig, I hope Craig doesn't. Well, if he sees this, he needs to hear this anyway. <laughs> I, I, I yelled at him for it. I was like, hey, no more sideways hugs. I want heart to heart, belly button to belly button. Yeah. You know, that's a hug. That's a hug. And so, but I'm able to do that now because I've done the work. I'm able to go to a massage therapist every week because I've done the work and it feels good. I can accept that. I'm okay with it. Hmm. Um, so that's really the physical work. Um, my workouts, morning workouts are my ritual. I have to do that. Otherwise, I'm unbalanced. I'm not a good human being in any way. I'm unproductive to my team. I'm unproductive to my clients. Uh, so that's a big part. That's my anchor, as uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson calls it. That's, that's, his, that's his anchor. Um, those are the extent of my big physical works that keep me grounded. But it feels so good to have someone manipulate your body in a way that a foam roller could never do or a, yeah. could never do. Yeah. Right? What do your days look like? Is there, is there any kind of like morning traditions that you have, like things that are really crucially important to keep you in yeah. a good place? Yeah. I do realize that I'm like a German Shepherd dog. Let me just start off by saying that. And a German Shepherd dog specifically must be doing something that makes them feel like they're contributing to the farm that they're on. An example is they need a shepherd. They need to know at this time, every day, we're taking the little sheep out, and my job is to run around and bark and keep them in a little corral for two hours and bring them back to their, their pen. Um, I've got a dog that's part German Shepherd, part Mastiff. She knows every morning, her name is Cookie, that we need to throw the ball 10 times, and she loves that. She looks forward to it. Once she does that, then you can just see her <sighs> relax and look out the window at the squirrels and growl at them because she's in here and they're out there. Uh, I'm very much like the German Shepherd dog. Mm. I need a routine. We're going to New York. I already know what my routine is going to be because we've been to New York enough. In fact, we've been to Maui on vacation once and I liked it so much we just keep going back every year because I have a routine there. I'm a routine oriented guy. If not, I will go find the darkness. I will search for the darkness. I will find trouble and I will go ass into it. What's the darkness look like? It's beyond self sabotage, it's self punish. It's punishment. Hmm. I not a proud of it. I don't go looking for it now. Uh, but man, I used to before. I used to, and, I, and I realized where it came from. And it's the mountain's gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. And so my days today look like I need a morning routine. I wake up. I go through my gratitude list. I don't do meditation. I've tried. It didn't work for me. I've got the attention span of a hummingbird. I go through my gratitude list. I text three people that I'm grateful for. I verbally express how grateful I am for whatever, the, the state of California, the city of Chino Hills, uh, the fact that I've got a pool, the fact that we've got two olive trees and they've got tiny little olives on them, whatever it is. Um, 
three, so three people I text, a gratitude text, which is really the most selfish thing I do because they're oh. like, oh, oh man, you're so great, da da da. So I get three people every morning right. to tell me how awesome I am, right. given outside yeah. of my wife and kids, right? Nice. So that's really six people every morning to tell me how awesome I am. And I love that. Who doesn't? Uh, three things I'm grateful for. And then, of course, the three things I'm going to do today. Mm. Like, a mental list of what are the three things I'm going to go dominate. It's not a list of five or 15, because when I used to do that, then I'd do 14 of the 15, and now I'm a loser. You're all dissatisfied. Yeah, yeah. Just three things. If, if I can do three things five days a week, bro, I've moved the needle so much in my life after a year, I'm good. Yeah. It's just three big things that I need to do. What's the, what was the self-punishment specifically look like? Unless it's, like, unmentionable. No, no, no. No, bro, I'm, I'm an open book. Really? Um <laughs> Like hanging yourself by hooks in your right. living room, right. which that would be cool. That's I a got thing. massive scars in my back. That, no, um, <laughs> we should certainly talk about that. Yeah, Re recently. <laughs> all right. So when I was younger, in my twenties, it was uh, going out and finding a lot of women. Now, on right. the surface, it doesn't look like self punishment, but People afterwards, you right. Well done. Mm -hmm. You know, it yeah. Keeps yeah keep it up, man. You're yeah, you're, you're awesome. stud. Yeah. Right, right. But I felt empty afterwards. Right, just. Uh, disgusted because uh, I knew what I was going in there for and to me it was a game and it was a game of conquering yep because I got conquered as a kid so now I can connect the dots right and so now I needed control I needed to conquer and uh, so when I was younger it was that in my 30s it was food I would literally stand in my kitchen in front of the fridge and consume four five six thousand calories I'm talking a bag of pretzels Schneider's pretzels with the whipped cream cheese, and when the whipped cream cheese was empty and there's still pretzels left, I'd get out butter, and I'd hold it in my hand, the square butter, right, the cube, and I'd hold it in my hand, warm it up, and I'd unwrap it, and I'd um, chow down, and then I'd go to sleep, right? I'd consume four, five, 6,000 calories at night, and then wake up disgusted and sick. Yeah, sick night's the worst time. Yeah. yeah, and I'm like, what am I doing? I'm such an imposter, I'm a fitness professional. How's this happening? Well, again, I just went from one punishment to the next, because, hey, now I'm married. I can't, I'm not going to go out and find women. But let me go find... See, but it's not a conscious thought. Like, I still need a tool to punish myself, so I'm going to replace this with that. Yeah. The human body just does it. And you go, oh, it's, I was stressed and that's why. Or, no, nah, man, I, just, I got nothing else to do on a Friday night. So there's bars and there's girls and that's what I'm doing. I'm in my 20s. What? That's, that's what every guy does. But how do you feel afterwards? Yeah. That's the question to ask. How do you feel afterwards? If you're like, man, I feel great. I can do it again. I feel energized. I feel like this is good. Cool, man. Have at it. Fill your boots. Yeah. But if you feel depressed, if you feel dirty, if you feel, in my case, like an imposter, bro, you got to explore. Yeah. And that's what I finally decided to do. Thank God for those anxiety attacks, honestly. Like, Huge. They, they were a gift to me. Totally. They were a gift. I do the overeating thing. And I think it's a, I think it's a, I know it's funny. You know, but it was, so I'll, I'll, I literally do the exact same <laughs> really? thing with, with butter. Hmm. So I'll mac down one of my, my, my friend, I had this big, uh, like gallon of olive oil yeah. that I like smashed in a very short amount of time. Cause I just, I just do like a lot of that stuff, yeah, yeah. but I'll do that with like nuts and like all oh, delicious sprouted organic, whatever, sure. and then, you know, but they still have calorie berries yeah. and then like butter. And I'll just do it over and over and over again. Yeah. And I see that as being something that I do to feel like, a, you know, I really want to hug. You know, I really want to feel loved. I really want to feel connected and feel like yeah. I have network and feel like I have like, yeah. but living in a place like, like LA, it's kind of like, you know, it's like the, the fire, you know, yes. it's like the heart of all that, that feeling of like, we promote connection. We promote, you know, network and tribe and all that. You know, but oftentimes you have a bunch of kind of like blind little individuals that are just in it for themselves with a mask of network and tribe. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I do. That's <laughs> I why I'm in Chino Hills. That's why I'm exactly 48 <laughs> miles away. Yeah. Look, look, look at the open space. People nod at you. They're watering their grass. You drive by, they nod at you and give you a tip of the hat. Right. That's, I'm here for, I, I have created a bubble. My wife calls it my two and a half mile bubble. My HQ, my gym, uh... Starbucks, and actually Starbucks now comes to me as you saw, but yeah. Starbucks is nearby in a two and a half, and then uh, and the sushi joint, Sushi 10 that I go to, um, which I would have loved to have taken you today. But, but anyway, the, the point is, all of that, my house, my office, all that is in the two and a half mile bubble, and I just want to live in it because it gives me a sense of peace and control, and if I can get people to come to me instead of me going to them, great. Uh, when I do go to them, I always go, what is my bubble going to be when I get there, whether it's New York or... London or wherever because if I don't have a bubble if I don't have a routine Let's go find some trouble 
darkness. Whoa. Yeah. Sounds like a good opportunity for you to ditch all that shit. See, like, buy a one-way ticket to a random place and see what happens. Or not. Well, Maybe I mean, it's these bad, days bad I, thing, I think I'm so, like, disciplined. I think you're evolved past that. So I think sometimes we can do that, too, where we attach to the, the feeling of, like, this is who I am. This is how I respond to that situation. Right. It's like, dude, that was seven years ago. Yeah. I know I wouldn't do that anymore. But it's just, I love the, it's like a security blanket. I love the security of the bubble and the routine so much. Yeah. I just look for it. I create it. But I know, like, give me a one-way ticket to anywhere and put hidden cameras on me. Like, I'll just create a routine when I get there. I'll figure it out. Yeah. You know? Like, yeah. today, me and my wife was like, hey, I was like, hey, look, I saw Brian Callen post on uh, Instagram that he's uh, at the Gotham City Comedy Club on Saturday. Let's add, let's add that to our routine. Because we've got a routine already set up. We're going right. to eat. Have you seen the documentary Hero Dreams of Sushi? Oh, I love it. So, okay. so good. The dude who was crying when Hero finally gave him some, some validation that you made the rice correctly after 10 years. Yeah. That guy moved to New York and opened up a sushi joint. Mm. That was part of our, it's part of our adventure here that we're going to do. Yeah. That, that we're part of the do. bubble. Part of the our extended bubble. Yeah. bubble. <laughs> yeah, so today I kind of tweaked the bubble. After that, we're, we're, we're going to go to the comedy club. Leave the kids in the hotel and go to the comedy club. Um, but I love having it all structured and planned. But if I bought a one-way ticket to wherever, unplanned, I'm so evolved these days, thankfully, that I would just look for structure and discipline and routine. Yeah. It feels good. Yeah, there's a, I think it was like Alan Watts. I was, I was listening to some audio thing he was saying, and he said he's seen um, guys in India create a sacred space just by creating, literally, like taking a stick in the ground and creating a little circle around them. Brilliant. I think that's the really beautiful thing, and that's something Brilliant. that I've, I've gathered upon staying in hostels and random places around the world where I'm like, this is not in alignment with what I'm creating, you yeah, know? Yeah, but yeah. at the same time, like, okay, whoa, oh, yeah. I'm in that, what do you call it, HARP? Not HARP. What was the, the acronym for the oh, LARP? Oh, uh, LARPing? <laughs> <laughs> Live action role play. What was it? Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Yeah. You know, so by it being in those situations, all of a sudden, I think that's when a lot of those new ideas end up coming out. You know, and you're in this situation where it's like, oh, this isn't what I want the bubble to be. But it's like, okay, wait, I can, I can still kind of create my own thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like a real skill. Yeah. But that's funny that you would, I call it halting, that you would go into a halting state. But then you talk your way out of it. So you're at the hostel. You're like, oh, my God, this isn't what I signed up for. This isn't aligned with my vision. I'm yeah. halting, whatever. I'm, I'm freaking out. And then you find that safe spot. You yeah. find that sacred spot. Mm. Like, that's evolution, bro. That's, and going back to Maxwell Maltz, where we started, um, Psycho-Cybernetics, he really talks about the theater of the mind, and then the theater of the mind, and they, they proved it in World War I, that these guys, you know, bombs blowing up, they're in a tiny little foxhole pressed together, dead bodies next to them, but they find, the ones that found the safe spot live to see the next day. Mm -mm. Those who didn't, panicked, freaked out, got up to run, and got shot. Yeah, yeah and then stress is the main... A main correlate to to um, inflammation, and then inflammation in the brain. There, you know, they are saying is a main correlate to depression. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I, I think that our capacity to be in an inherently stressful world and still find that like equipoise or balance or you know bubbleness. Yeah, that's like some of the biggest healthcare you could possibly think of. Yeah, but it's not as tangible as having like here, take the pills. Right. Right. You know, so we don't really, it's, it's, there's not as much monetary gain in educating people on how to create little bubbles for themselves. So we just kind of, we keep on harping on the other stuff. Yeah. Well, we also want, it's, it's two part, right? And it's the big pharma it has made it such a lucrative industry, which is why mood enhancing drugs that are prescribed now are the, the, the highest level of prescription ever. And then we as society, we want the fast fix because really I have to like measure my halting. I have to see if I'm hungry, lonely, angry, tired. Yeah. Kevin, you can't just give me a pill, you know? No, you actually have to see. One of the things that would like trigger me into like having slight feelings of anxiety, I'd have my laptop in the morning. I'd work off my couch. My dog's sitting across from me over there. My wife's taking the kids to, uh, to, to school. And I'm working. And for some reason, dude, no one tell, like, I'm my own boss. Why am I doing this? I have no idea. I go, oh, I got 32 emails. I gotta go pee. I'm not gonna pee until I go like, clear out my inbox. Why? Mm. Why? So now I'm angry because I gotta go pee and I'm holding it, I'm holding it, I'm holding it, right? There's literally anger. So hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Uh, soon I start getting hungry for water because I'm not gonna get, get up and get a drink of water and pee until. So I have two of the four elements 
And then my wife comes back home and is like, hey, hon, how's it going? Fine, I'm doing fine. Right. I, I turned this way because the door is right behind me in case you're yeah, wondering. Was right, it, right? <laughs> but, but it's like, wait, what? Why are you reacting, you idiot? Oh, I was out of my inbox and I had to pee. And just how about you get up and go pee, you jackass, right? And so these are the simple tools that I had to teach myself when I learned from Kevin. It's okay to stop at, at email number three and go pee, get water, look out the window, pet cookie, and then sit down again. Yeah. But, but all my worth and value came from getting that shit done. And so that had higher priority than my health. Yeah, there was a, a, a study, or you could call it a statistic, where they were watching, I believe it was in Europe, England, we'll have to, we'll have to fact check this one, but um, they were watching judges and their, uh, the rule for people where they were given parole, per, parole or not, and the biggest, highest indicator was whether the judge was fed or not. So if the judge was fed, all of a sudden it's like, I love everyone. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Let him he loose. seems innocent. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> but if you're, but if you're you hungry, yeah. then all of a sudden like, no, this guy definitely did yeah. it. It's he a trigger. He's off. Yeah. yeah so it's just Could you imagine if your life was hanging on that balance, though? Oh, I think it already is. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe well, not so, mine or yours. Yeah, but, but I'm but, happy we're not but in, moments. in jail. Yeah. Holy smokes. Yeah, in moments it is. Yeah. In moments it is. You're right. How many decisions have we made in a state of hunger that, we would have otherwise made the opposite decision. If yeah. We were fed. Yeah. And then, the, 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 so then the, the deeper, and we can, we'll wrap up here soon, but the, the, the kind of deeper question is okay, cool, that's a, a very literal hunger. I want a sandwich. But then there's like, okay, what about people that live in a, in a continual state of hunger for I need validation, I need, you know, whatever yes. it may be, you know, yes. because I'm not gay, because I'm not, you know, I am good enough. Yeah. You know, so it's like, oh, wow, interesting. These decisions that we make out of hunger, how many freaking people in our culture are just perpetually hungry? Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. We, we are walking around. <laughs> we are walking around hungry. We are walking around with open cuts on us, bumping into each other, and hence the word hangry, right? Yeah, we, sure. I, I mean, we, we joke around about, hey, he's hangry, but yeah, there's really something to that. When you're angry or when you're hungry, you are angry. When you have open cuts emotionally, when you come to hug me, or when you tell me something, oh, what did you mean by that? What did you mean by that hug? What did you mean by that, mm. by that high five? It's like, I don't know, I was fucking hugging you, your friend. Yeah. But I'm taking it differently because of the wounds that I haven't healed. Cool. Yeah. Thanks so much, man. Thank you, man. It really, really means a lot. I, I, I connect with so many different levels of your, your story, and uh, so I really appreciate it. It's, it's, it's beautiful to see someone that is, you know, from an outside perspective, you really embody the masculine thing really well you know but you're also digging into all this I'm other a big stuff. teddy bear <laughs> yeah right it's a big deal you know but uh, it's yeah. like just we get we get fucking confused with all the, the you know the magazine covers of the rock like we very rarely see a magazine cover of someone doing something passive right it's always some like <laughs> you know so we're yeah. like okay that's what I gotta yeah. so it's cool to you know have that we will dig into the yeah, other parts I really of it. appreciate this opportunity, man. This was, <laughs> I had no idea what to expect, <laughs> and it was such a pleasant surprise from, from what I learned about my physiology uh, to pooping. what I... Yeah. <laughs> it's a very important component. I talk about pooping with almost every podcast guest. Okay. Yeah. You know what? You really make it an easy conversation. No <laughs> joke, man. You really do. Cool. And that's got to be something to be said about you. Sweet. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. How do people learn more about you? How do people find all the... You guys got so much good stuff. Uh, social media, just BedrosCoolian.com. And I'm all over social media. Awesome. I'm that guy. All right. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah.